Tell us, where did you grow up? I was born and grew up in Texarkana, Texas. It's on the Texas-Arkansas border. Lived five blocks from the Arkansas line. How did your parents wind up in Texarkana? My mother uh, lived there. She had graduated from high school. My dad lived in New Boston, 20 miles away. His dad had passed away when he was 14. He had to drop out of high school, worked as a cowboy. Then he became a cotton broker. He met my mother uh, at a dance on sort of a blind date, and the rest is history. Tell me how you first got going in business. All of my business training was at my father's knee. I sat in his office and watched him deal with the farmers as a cotton broker. His philosophy was, treat them fairly, treat them right, and you can do business with them year after year after year. Some of the happiest memories of my childhood are riding with him down to the farms, over the dirt roads, into these little houses where people live very modestly, visiting with them off season to keep their friendship, keep their, let him, the farmer know that my father was interested in his business the next year. But the thing that he practiced was fairness. He would give them a fair price. Some of the other brokers would try to take advantage of them, and as a result, typically he got the first opportunity to buy their cotton. Then he would let me go with him to the horse auctions and the cattle auctions on Friday. First, he would let me buy and sell bridles, but I couldn't keep a bridle. I'd have to buy one for $3, sell it for three fifty, sell it for $4. I was what you call a day trader. Then when I got pretty good at that, he let me buy saddles, and I could do the same thing. Then when I got pretty good at that, he would let me buy calves, but I couldn't take anything home. And then finally, he was letting me buy individual horses and individual cattle, but I could never take anything home. Now, those are marvelous lessons, and he would sort of stand in the background and smile and coach me. So that's how I learned business at my father's knee. It was a wonderful way to grow up every afternoon. See, children don't have these opportunities now. From the time I was six, probably until the time I was 15, 14, he would pick me up or meet me at home typically after school, and by 4.30 in the afternoon, he and I were off riding somewhere for a couple of hours. He was my best friend. And I had a lot of good friends, but he was my best friend. Russ, tell me about your mom, and I know she had a big influence on you as well. Well, no, she was a saint, and nobody could have had a better mother. All her life, she reached out to help other people. We lived five blocks from the railroad tracks. The dirt road from the tracks up to our house. We were in the Depression. The hobos, we'd call these homeless or street people now, we called them hobos then, would come by our house and again and again knock on the door and ask for food. Now today you'd have the doors locked, you'd be worried to death. Then you never locked the doors. There was no fear that these people would hurt you, they were just hungry. And my tiny little mother always fed them, even though we didn't really have food to give away. One day a hobo came up and ate and he said, lady, do you have a lot of people come here? And she said, yes. And he said, would you like to know why? And she just smiled and said, well, sure. He says, come out here and I'll show you. And right on the edge of the road was a mark. And he said, lady, you're a mark. And that mark had been put there by earlier hobos saying, you'll get free food here. He left. And I turned to my mother and I said, do you want me to get rid of that mother? And I'll never forget this as long as I live. And she says, no, son. These are people just like us. The only difference is they're down on their luck. And as I think about my parents, I realize they live their entire lives working and sacrificing so that my sister and I could have the dreams that they had that would never materialize. And all of their dreams materialized through us. So it was a beautiful way to grow up. You mentioned your sister. Was she older or younger than you? Uh, 18 months older. She was the perfect child. I lived in her, I always live in somebody's shadow. Growing up, I lived in her shadow. Every time I went to school, I was asked, why aren't you like your sister? And uh, that was, you know, I just wasn't as smart as my sister. Now, today, I live in my son's shadow, and I hope we'll, we'll talk about him later. But I guess I was destined to live in somebody's shadow. I'll tell you one last story to show you the kind of parents I had. I remember one, I was probably 10 years old. I walked in the house one day, and my mother had tears in her eyes. It was in November. And Mother was very strong. She never cried. And I said, Mother, what's wrong? And she says, Your dad has sold his horse. And I said, Well, why did he sell his horse? 
And she said, so that you and your sister could have a Christmas. Now, he never, ever said a word to me about that. I never would have known why. But see, that's, that may be, you know, those are a lot of little stories. But uh, people have asked me over the years when I first felt rich, and I've always said, I was born rich. So you came from a family of modest means. Well, you know, it was interesting. The house we lived in cost $4,000. But that was back when a dollar was still a dollar. It was a nice little house. Uh, we always saved money. We always got by. Everybody worked when I was a child. I started to work when I was seven years old. When I say this to young people now, they feel like I must have been harshly treated. No, everybody worked. This is, we just say you make do and uh, we'll get by. So my first thing I ever did was break horses. Uh, I was a good horseback rider. I was lightweight because I was only seven years old. I could break them when they were young, and we could sell them earlier because they were broken and ready to go. I got paid a dollar a horse. I learned some valuable lessons there. First, and you can look at my nose and see I learned the hard way, is don't let them buck. Uh, you don't want to know how many times I was thrown until I figured that out. And the typical cure that you'd get thrown, get knocked out, and uh, put your head under a water faucet, and you'd get back on. But we learned not to let them buck, learned how to break them in a fraction of the time it originally took, and I was making pretty good money breaking horses. Then I got to selling flower seeds, garden seeds, Christmas cards, Saturday evening posts, a whole variety of things uh, during when I was eight, nine, and ten years old. Uh, learned wonderful things there. For example, years later after I was financially successful, I was riding up a chairlift in Vail, Colorado. The owner turned to me and said, Ross, would you like to buy this ski resort? And I looked at him and said, no, I'm not interested. And he laughed. He said, well, it didn't take you long to make that decision. And I said, I learned when I was eight years old not to get in a seasonal business. He said, what do you mean? I said, I sold Christmas cards. It was terrific till after Christmas, and there was nothing to do. You had to get in a new business. He laughed, told that story all over the country. So you learned these valuable lessons. And you had a paper route as well, didn't you? I had several. My first route was a morning route on the Arkansas side, and it was just middle class. My second route was an afternoon route downtown. Again, see, none of this was planned, but it's such a wonderful education. I started off first through papers to the bankers and the lawyers in the bank building. Then I worked my way on down Main Street to the small store owners. Then I got on further down Main Street and delivered papers to the houses of prostitution, which my mother was not very happy about. Then. I turned the corner and delivered a paper to the Catholic priest. Then I went a half block and turned left, and I delivered newspapers to the black doctors and dentists, the black professionals in the Depression. These are people who had overcome unbelievable odds to get a college education. Then I came back up, delivered papers to a feed and seed store, and that was my route. Then the next summer, I couldn't get a route. So I was really hustling to get a route. This is when you look for work. Jobs didn't come to you. And the only paper out available was in the poorest section of Texarkana, Newtown and Avondale. Avondale had the poorest whites. Newtown adjoined it had the poorest blacks. The general feeling was nobody could read. Nobody would want the paper. The paper reversed the rate. Normally you got the paper boy got, you collected a quarter. The paper boy got seven and a half cents. The newspaper got 17 and a half cents. They reversed it because I had to ride a horse because it was sand roads, you couldn't ride a bicycle, and they figured it wouldn't work anyhow. I went around and knocked door to door, and almost all these people wanted the paper. Now it's amazing. With luck, they were making $9 a week, but they wanted the newspaper. So I delivered the paper out there at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, and everybody else was afraid to go into the neighborhood. Nobody ever tried to harm me. It was just these were very poor people, but they were kind, gentle, good people. No problem. We, uh, we, so I delivered the newspaper there, and one of my most vivid childhood memories, after we got the route started, well, I really have two. One is they tried to change the rate on me. So I went to the publisher. I learned a lesson here. Go to the top. A week before they tried to change the rate, the publisher, Mr. C.E. Palmer, who was a wealthy man in the Depression, had newspapers all up through Arkansas and Little Rock, radio stations. I mean, he was a big success. He'd locked himself in his office. It was noon. I happened to be in the newspaper. 
heard him banging on the door, went over and let him out. A week later, they tried to reverse my rate because I was making too much money. But I had created the route out of nothing. So I went in to see Mr. Palmer. I said, Mr. Palmer, do you remember me? He says, yeah, you're the boy that let me out the other day. And I said, that's right. And I said, I had a contract for your paper and you've reneged on it. And he looked at me and just broke up. Here's this 13-year-old boy talking to him politely, but just saying you broke your deal. He said, well, what's the deal we had? And I explained it to him. And he said, and why did we change it? I said, because I've made the route successful. And he says, son, I'll look into it. Well, of course, I kept my rate because he was a man of his word. That's a lesson I learned. But the sweetest lesson I learned, my dad had to have a kidney operation. And this was like brain surgery it would be today. Uh, we were very close. This was going to exhaust our financial resources, to say the least. That was not a problem. Uh, we, you know, we would have borrowed, sold, given away everything we had. That's the way you did it. But you couldn't do it in Texarkana. We had to go to Shreveport, Louisiana, 74 miles away. Nobody else would throw the newspaper out for me. Thought it was too dangerous. I went to my customers, knocked on the door, explained my situation, said, I'll be back in a few days. I hope you'll keep taking the paper. Almost 100% of them said, son, save the papers and deliver them when you get back. And I said, but you don't want old newspapers. And they said, that's not the point. If your dad is having a kidney operation in Shreveport, you need the money. Now, these are people making $9 a week. No, I learned a lot about the goodness of poor people through that experience, and I carry that with me for the rest of my life. I was in Newtown not too long ago. Uh, interesting enough, I was there with Barbara Walter. An older man came out, looked at me, recognized me from the television, you know, from having seen me on television, started laughing. He says, there's my paper boy. And we had a lot of fun talking together. Went through a General Motors plant in Arlington. One of the factory workers looked up and started laughing. He says, there's my paper boy. So uh, I have I had great memories, and it was a wonderful experience, and I learned a lot, Murphy, that I carry with me for the rest of my life. Ross, can you remember the first time that you spoke and people paid attention to what you said? Well, that's a tough one. Probably, well, my earliest recollection, I was president of the student council at Texas County Junior College. 200 students. The decision had been made by the, the, the board of the college to expand the college into one square, square block right across the street. The students and most of the teachers and professors felt like the college should be relocated so that it could grow. Now, I was 18 years old, and students didn't have much status back in those days, but my parents had taught me to always stand on principle, and this is the first time I planted both feet, but in a very tactful, respectful way as president of the student council, I went to the board and told them we thought they were making a mistake. They should relocate the college to a campus where it had a number of acres and could grow and expand. To say that this created tension is an understatement. I had a wonderful professor, Claude Pinkerton, who was our student council advisor, who said, Ross, you're doing the right thing, stand on principle. My parents were saying, son, you're doing the right thing, stand on principle. The other students were saying, do the right thing, stand on principle. I stood there and got my head torn off repeatedly, but that's the bad news. But see, I learned then, it doesn't matter what happens to you. What matters is, did you do the right thing? Today, that college is on a 100-acre campus. The last time I checked, it has over 5,000 students, not 200 anymore, and is a part of the University of Texas system and is a tremendous resource to that part of Texas. Thank goodness we got it moved. It was worth the headaches and pain. When did you first know that you wanted to attend the Naval Academy? Now, there was a fellow two blocks away from me that I really admired, but I didn't have much contact with him, named Josh Morris, Jr. He went to the Naval Academy, and at that point, I knew I wanted to go, even though I had never seen the ocean or never seen a ship. He told me about it, and I knew I wanted to go. But your appointment was not an immediate one, was it? Well, I had the dream, and we started uh, filling out all the forms, but we did not have any political influence. So I'd started my early my senior year didn't get in high school didn't get it tried my freshman year in co college didn't get it and in March or April of my second year in junior college one day out of the blue we got a telegram 
you walk into my office today, that telegram is there framed. It changed my life. And I had a principal appointment at the United States Naval Academy. Well, that was it. I went in June. I was sworn in on June the 27th, my 19th birthday. And uh, the I had, now again, see, I had had the reverse of a military upbringing. I was free to wander around in this little town, but not totally free because everybody knew my folks and everybody knew me. And if I did anything wrong, they would call my parents immediately. Wouldn't you love to be able to recreate that today in our country? I didn't know this until years later. And this is a story that was told to me. I, I don't know if it's true or not. It's an interesting story. I assume it is. After EDS was a success, a man called me and said, Ross, didn't you ever wonder how you got an appointment to the Naval Academy? And I said, yes, I have, but I sure wasn't going to ask at the time. He laughed. He said, look, I was a senator's aide. We were cleaning up his office. And I said, Senator, you have an unfilled appointment to the Naval Academy. And the Senator said, does anybody want it? And I said to the Senator, well, we have this boy from Texarkana that's been trying to get one for three years. And the Senator said, just give it to him. Yeah, see, that's pretty good luck. Now, I've been lucky all my life. I can tell you luck stories till, you know, the world goes flat. But that was a great piece of luck to be able to go to the Naval Academy and have that wonderful opportunity. Got in the Navy, this was my chance, among other things, to see the world. But first, to meet people from all 50 states. It was fascinating. And these were great guys. These were all people, again, most of them more talented than I, because of the selection criteria at the Naval Academy. So they were a great source of inspiration. We had people from the Philippines, people from South America. It was a, quite a group of people. That was impact number one. Impact number two was... Uh, the education, the quality of the education was terrific. So I really got a good engineering education. But now a funny thing happened at the end of my first year. They measured your leadership skills in this way. Your classmates, the upperclassmen, the military officers, and the academic officers all evaluated you. And then one day they posted them on a bulletin board. And I stood right at the top of my class. Now, I was 20 years old, or 19, going on 20. And I remember looking at that, and it was like finding out you could play the piano by ear. Nobody had ever used the word leadership around me. I'd been president of the student council, this, that, and the other. But it was literally saying, gee, this is something I can do. And that evaluation then took place three times a year. And again and again and again, my peers, my upperclassmen, the military officers and the academic officers, ranked me at the top. And then we were taught leadership. I got a wonderful engineering education, but the greatest thing that happened to me at the Naval Academy is I was taught leadership. Then I got to practice those principles as a young Naval officer. My junior and senior year, the midshipman uh, honored me by electing me as president of the class. Uh, I was elected lifetime president of my class in senior year. It took a lot of ribbon about that. Uh, I was chairman of the honor committee. And then again, one more time, before I got out of, you know, had this experience in Texarkana, we, as chairman of the honor committee, we had a midshipman that had done something that was absolutely improper. All of the midshipmen on the honor committee felt he should be dismissed. He came from a prominent family. There was tremendous political pressure not to dismiss him. A tentative decision was made to overlook it. Well, here I am at this point, 22 years old, just about to be 23. I resign as class president and chairman of the honor committee as a matter of principle. Now, God bless Admiral Joy, who negotiated the Korean truce. He called me over to his office. He was an, old, an older man, even as an admiral. And I sat there. He invited me to sit down. And he said, now, son, tell me why you're resigning. And I just spelled it out to him. And as I got into it, he started to smile. Because, see, we had been taught when honor is involved, be deaf to expediency. That had been taught and just burned into our souls at the Naval Academy. And when I finished, he looked at me and smiled. He says, I'll take care of it. You're right. He took care of it. So justice, try, the fair thing was done. Otherwise, we would have wrecked the whole honor system. So again, you know, I, I took a beating on that. But 
I learned again a second time, uh, standing up for what you believe is worthwhile and just take the heat that goes with it. Russell, I know your parents were awfully proud of you at the academy, especially your father. Uh, there's no way to express how much it meant to him to be there the day I graduated. It was a tremendous sacrifice. They drove from Texarkana to Annapolis in their 49 Plymouth, and just, it was one of, I'm sure, one of the big moments of his life in that he got to live his dream through me, and he got to live it through my sister. And, but he was a very interesting man. Uh, we wanted to take him to New York because we were fairly close to New York. He agreed to go. We spent a day there and he said, well, I've seen it now. And he wanted to get back to Texas. You also had an opportunity to go right into active duty after graduation. What was that like? I had an opportunity to get a ship that was going around the world. Now, one thing I need to tell you is I had met Margot on a blind date on October the 18th 1952. That's almost exactly 40 years ago. I fell in love immediately. It took me four years to win her over and get her to marry me, though, so we have to go out to 1956. But even though I was really smitten with Margot, I was absolutely attracted to this cruise around the world to Korea. The truce had been negotiated, but not signed. Admiral Joy negotiated it, but it had not yet been signed, and there was a chance the conflict would start again. So we went straight to Korea. I reported aboard the USS Sigourney, a destroyer, again on my 23rd birthday at two in the morning. Seven o'clock in the morning, we got underway to go around the world. Had a great captain, Captain Lionheart, a great executive officer, uh, Cap uh, Commander Stock, and we had a terrific adventure. Now, as junior officer, I got all the bad jobs. And since we were gone nine months, there were no new junior officers. So I was stuck as junior officer. Uh, I got shore patrol every time we went ashore. That was an education. Uh, the, uh, I was in, oh, as I was Protestant chaplain. We got all the way to Midway Island before the truce was declared. Now, every Sunday, we packed the fan tail when we had religious services. They were coming to church on Sunday. We were going into combat. We got to Midway Island, they declared a truce. And I realized I was not Billy Graham after that. So my, my, my uh, chaplain skills were basically a function and my ability to teach first aid and damage control. But I will never forget that experience. 17 seas and oceans, uh, 22 foreign countries. Uh, I have enough stories to last a lifetime from that. Great experience, great, great people. The crew, the enlisted man crew were all products of depression. These guys were hard as nails. They'd come up the hard way, they'd never had any breaks. But I, they were so bright, so literate, and so articulate. The only difference was I had gotten the brakes. Ross, in the mid-50s, you married that girl that you met on a blind date back at Annapolis, didn't you? Well, finally talked. Uh, well, first off, I need to go back. We had our blind date. I was immediately in love. Uh, anybody that ever knows Margot immediately falls in love with her, men and women. She was very, very popular in Baltimore, where she went to college all the young doctors at Johns Hopkins. I had big time competition. Plus, I was gone all the time. And, uh, but at the end of the first date, she went back to her college, Goucher, and all of her friends asked her about this midshipman she'd had a date with because she really didn't want to go on a blind date. She had too many options. And they haunt her with this story today. She hesitated for a minute and then said, well, he's really clean looking. So that was her first impression. Of course, all midshipmen are clean lucky. Then uh, I talked her into marrying me. We married in September uh, 15th, uh, 1956. Uh, she taught school my, the year I was in the Navy. We lived in a tiny little apartment in Whitford, Rhode Island, right across from Howard Johnson's, which was good. She was learning to cook. And uh, so we'd go to Howard Johnson's. Plus, any time a ship was in port, she would like, she'd eaten the officer's mess with me, and we could go to the movie on the base for 10 cents. So it was a pretty good first year life. And you finished out your term of service on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, I finished my term of the story, went to an aircraft carrier, loved, the, well, the air, oh, it was like heaven. It was because you had an adequate place to sleep, you had a nice place to eat, it was a huge thing. The last part of my term on the Lady, my job as assistant navigator was to live on the bridge with the captain. 
And it was fascinating. We'd have a screen of nine destroyers around us. We'd have uh, tankers to refuel us. We'd have replenishment ships to bring food in, so on and so forth, and submarines underneath us, and airplanes landing and launching night and day. I knew how to do that. That's all I knew how to do. Now let's go back to luck again. Okay, I was real lucky to get that appointment. I was really lucky to meet Margot on a blind date. Now then, suddenly we have an IBM executive come aboard as a guest of the Secretary of the Navy for a one-week cruise. He's on the bridge all the time. I'm on the bridge all the time. See, he knew how to do a lot of things, but he didn't know how to do the one thing I knew how to do, and so he found it interesting. So one day he said, the captain mentioned to him casually that I was getting out of the Navy. And he said to the captain, would you mind if I talk to him? And the captain said, no, he's leaving the Navy. And he came over and said, son, how would you like a job with IBM? Now I'm embarrassed to tell this story, but I looked him in the eye and said, mister, I'm 27 years old. I have worked since I was seven years old. I always had to look for work. And this is the first time in my life anybody has ever offered me a job. And I said, you bet I'd like to talk to you about going to work for your company. And here's the terrible part. And I said, I don't even know what you do. Well, I went to work for IBM, had a great five-year adventure uh, working with IBM in the early days of the computer business. We drove to Dallas, had our 52 Plymouth. It's now 1957. We found a small apartment. Everything we owned was in the back of our car. Now, this is important because we were just as happy then as we are today. See, tangible things don't bring happiness. We were happy then, we are happy now. And you were phenomenally successful. A whole lot has been written about my sales record and it's been overblown dramatically. All I did is work hard all day, every day. Most of my pals worked about a half day because there was such a demand for computers. I worked all day, every day, and it was fun, and boy, did I learn a lot. And the most important thing I learned were those great principles of Tom Watson, Sr., in terms of how you deal, treat your people. The customer is king. Those fundamental things that are the hallmark of all my businesses came right from that IBM training and right from my dad's office dealing with the farmers. Thank you, Ross, and thanks to all of you. That's all the time we have for this evening, but we hope you will join us again when we will pick up the Ross Perot story with the beginning of his business success. And mark your calendars for Election Day. That's November 3rd. Dear Ross, I was awarded this Purple Heart for wounds received during a Vietnam ambush. Over the years, its value to me has grown significantly. And like my family, it is priceless. I would be honored if you would accept the loan of my Purple Heart to keep with you throughout the campaign. I believe that it can serve as a compelling reminder that the hard battle ahead can and must be won. Let it also remind you of the army of ordinary citizens that is mustered to your call and looks to you to stop the hemorrhaging of the American spirit and to restore honesty, integrity, and responsibility to our government. Like you, I firmly believe that if we stand united, we will win. Good luck, Ross. Ross Perot's Solutions, balancing the budget and reforming government.